if you're a large organization, the first step is to first understand where AI may be suitable. So maybe you'll find a lot of inefficiencies in customer service, a lot of manual repetitive work where there isn't much software automation going on. So you want to identify those areas and specific opportunities. Welcome to the EO Media Podcast Series on AI. AI. I am your host, Robert van der Swer, joining you from EO Netherlands. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Kavita Kineshin. Kavita is founder of Apenosis Analytics. She's an AI strategist, educator, and a consultant. And by the way, she holds a PhD from the University of Illinois and has over 15 years of experience in the field of AI. And recently, she published a book titled The Business Case for AI. Kivita, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And during my vacation in France, I had the opportunity to, to read your book. And I must say, I was really relieved to find some of the strategic guidance in the overwhelming world of generative AI tools that is flooding the world. So let's start by discussing what motivated you, what motivated you to write the book. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. Um, so the book actually came about... Um, because of my experience in the field. So I've been doing, working on AI projects from a very academic setting. So this was way back in like 2005. And from there I progressed on to solve the industry problems. And then I started working with um, leaders and then I became a consultant. And then I saw how AI projects were actually failing. And they were not failing because the problems were not solvable. Most of the problems were solvable, but there were a lot, lots of misunderstanding about what this AI thing is. So, for example, leaders think that AI can automate entire workflows, but that's not how AI works. It works for very specific tasks. So even if you take generative AI, it's you have to give it a task for it to work on. But leaders were, uh, had different expectations of what AI would do. So they kind of thought it was some sort of a magic that you plug in and it would just do its thing. Um, so the, so I wanted to address that um, knowledge gap between what AI is at a technical level versus what it is at the leadership level. So bringing both groups together to the same on the same page so that they can then collaborate, find the correct uh, use cases for businesses, um, and then pick, just figure out how best to deploy AI to get value from it. So that's how the book really came about. So you probably have been quite busy the past few months. Yeah, so I've been getting a lot of inquiries about using generative AI for this, using generative AI for that. And then when I talk to people about the risks and uh, what they should know about, then they're like, oh, oh, maybe I, I should not try to start with generative AI, maybe something different. So it has its use cases, but you need to know what, it is, and uh, what are the risks associated with a tool like that, like ChatGPT, for example? One of the common questions uh, we often, quite often get at EO, uh, where do I begin? So, for instance, um, there are many um, uh, online summits on AI, and some of these uh, teams, they're very excited uh, about the, whole, the possibilities of generative AI in particular. And they, maybe you recognize it. They come in, they run into the office on Monday morning and they say, yeah, we need to start with uh, generative AI. Is that the right approach or should we advise them, hold your horses, slow down a bit and think? Yes. Uh, so I would say get your hands dirty with generative AI, like test out ChatGPT, see what it is, uh, um, give it tasks, repetitive tasks, give it more than one task, give it different tasks. See it's uh, what the output is like, what are the problems, try to get a feel for what is happening. So you get an idea of how AI systems generally work, how they make mistakes, how they are not always accurate. Sometimes they make up information. Um, and you can also see how they fail on like math problems. You think that ChatGPT has common sense reasoning power, but sometimes it fails on very simple math problems. So try to get a feel for it because you need to like keep up with the hype of course but once you have a feel for it now try to understand where generative ai sits in this whole ai spectrum 
because generative AI is not AI. AI is a big field in itself and generative AI is, I would say, one part of that field. And once you know um, the capabilities of generative AI, where it's just trying to generate things for you based on prompts, based on your input, then you'll start seeing what are the use cases it's best used for. Um, and once you have that, that whole AI understanding, I think you should take a step back and see where the opportunities are in your company. So think about complex decision-making problems that are repetitive. And with the use of some software automation, you can see some tangible benefits. So those are the type of problems where AI can really deliver value. So it's really about better decision-making. Better decision-making for sure. I, it's always good to get your hands dirty, but you need to take a step back and see if really this is a tool that you need and you want to use. Yeah. So, of course, it's nice to play around with uh, generative AI and it's very entertaining at some times. And well, yeah. I'm amazed sometimes by the quality of the output and also uh, if, if you look at the mid-journey uh, drawings and pictures it's, and, yeah. and generated videos and... It blows my mind, but you know, if you do, if you, if you set a step back and we want to incorporate AI in, this, in, in a strategy, where do I start? What's the first step that I have to make to develop a strategy? If you're a large organization, the first step is to first understand where AI may be suitable. So maybe you'll find a lot of inefficiencies in customer service, a lot of manual repetitive work where there isn't much software automation going on. So you want to identify those areas and specific opportunities. Because once you have that understanding of where you could use AI, then you can start planning. So you're, you're making data-driven decisions. So let's say a lot of your opportunities are in customer service. So maybe you want to make that your competitive advantage. Maybe you have one or two problems in HR, but customer service looks really promising and you want to compete there with the use of more intelligent automation to make your employees more productive, customers getting better service. So thinking through the opportunities first. So that gets you thinking about um, where to, to narrow your focus. Then there's, there's also this um, longer term strategy where your company needs to be prepared for AI, um, the AI, uh, decade, I would say, uh, because AI is very data hungry. Uh, you require special infrastructure. Uh, a lot of the a lot of cultural elements to think about. So you need this long term preparation as well. So think about um, the data. How is your data infrastructure doing? Are you collecting data sufficiently from the daily running of your business? Are these data stores accessible? Now, a lot of companies have data stores, but sometimes they are not accessible. You can't use the data for some reason. So you want to make that data store universally accessible in your company, um, if it's possible. And then think about cultural elements. So how are you going to educate everyone in your, employ in your company uh, about what is this AI thing? Because there's a lot of... Um, reservations about using AI. People are afraid that it's going to replace their jobs and they're just going to be out of job in the next few years. Is it, are we replacing jobs with AI? Because I think it's a myth, but uh, what's your opinion? On yeah, I, I personally think it's not 100% true. So if your job is very narrow, where you're just doing one task, like finding keywords for SEO, for example, then yeah, your job can easily be replaced by a chat GPT type of tool. But often our jobs are not that narrow. We are doing more than that. We are getting these keywords, we are writing the article, we are doing fact checking, we are doing a lot of other things surrounding that core automation job, the, the core job that can be automated. So what I think is our jobs will become um, more augmented, AI augmented, and we will be more productive uh, in the whole rather than our job being replaced. Unless, of course, like I said, it's a very narrow job that you're um, handling. 
Now, let's say uh, I have a small traditional packaging manufacturing company with 75 employees. Uh, my dad uh, founded the company. Uh, oh. It's a pretty old fashioned company with a lot of manual work, with a lot of machinery. Um, not internet savvy, not very digital. Uh, and a lion's share of, uh, of companies are, of course, not in the digital age at this very moment. Uh, well, uh, what advice would you give them to transform their traditional manufacturing processes and manufacturing companies into the well digital world and even in the AI world? In the AI world, there's a lot that you can do in the quality assurance area. So detecting defects before things are sent out to consumers. So because, um, as you know, machines can see very small defects that the human eye may miss. And humans may take like 15 to 20 minutes to detect one defect, but an AI system can do this in milliseconds of a time. So by just using AI in the whole manufacturing line in different areas, for spotting defects, for spotting like maybe you couldn't attach the code label accurately. Is it attached or not? It, is the code label um, uh, even accurate to start with? So try to do a lot of the nitty gritty work can be uh, handled by AI systems. And the humans can be there in the loop to um, maybe verify those that are flagged as, hey, this looks defective. So verify that there is, in fact, a defect. Um, so it really significantly boosts uh, the human's productivity in the manufacturing line itself. So I was really getting back from better decision making. And from that, it, it, basically, you determine a gap. So one gap is to be to be determined probably uh, from a culture perspective. There are people willing to work with the AI systems. And then there is a infrastructure, at least judging for your words, there is an, a gap in the infrastructure. Yes. Uh, in terms, if I've got old machinery, I have to collect data and I probably have to invest a lot of money in uh, optical recognition or in data gathering. Yeah. Um, so data gathering is one piece of the um, long-term preparation. Then the cultural elements, like you mentioned, and infrastructure. So Joe, if you have an AI system, how are you going to best deploy it? So today we have multiple uh, options that are out there. So it's the number of platforms for AI deployment is just growing. So I don't see that much uh, of a problem as more, um, you'll have to experiment to see which one works with your organization. And then the skills. So who's going to develop these tools? So are you going to outsource? Are you going to retrain your software engineers to get this AI and data science skills? Um, and also to support all of this, it's not free. You need to think about having a budget to retrain employees, get that infrastructure, get your data infrastructure in place. So all of that requires a sizable budget. Oh, it's just for the faint hearted. So you really have to invest money and take the risk. You'll have to invest money, uh, but not immediately. You'll have to start in phases. So that's where the strategy comes in. Yeah. So finding out the gaps, so where are you really lagging? Mm -hmm. And then prioritizing what needs to be done first. So maybe cultural element and data need to happen first before you can tackle the other pieces. And together with this, you can also still pilot um, a good AI project and that can close some of the gaps. So maybe, for example, you're piloting um, one of the projects in customer service and that helps you close some of the skills gap where you are actually actively retraining your employees, you are getting management more interested in AI. So you can do those things, um, I would say, in parallel. It's also showcase showcasing uh, successful projects to the, to the other members of the staff. Correct. Showcasing successful projects, the value it can create. And you're basically starting small. You're not trying to tackle all of the projects together. You're starting with the lowest hanging fruit with a high impact. There's no such thing as uh, we do a transition in like six months and we go from a traditional manufacturing company to a fully automated uh, AI driven uh, uh, company. It takes I time when it takes money. Yeah, yeah I, I don't believe that it's possible for a large company to transition in six months, but you can get started. 
you can definitely deploy one or two projects in production, creating value. And at the same time, you're preparing the company for the digital transformation era. So and I have, and once I need, I need to know, I, ne I know what decisions to make. I have, so I what, and what kind of information I need. Then there's the question of developing models. I can code. Coding scares, mm -hmm. scares me. I had other words in mind, but it scares me. And mm -hmm. I think it's, I don't know how to deal with it. Do I need to hire a data analyst? data specialist can I, do i need to develop my own tools or are there uh, off the shelf tools av tools available yeah so it's very dependent on the problem so for a lot of problems like say qa in manufacturing lines there are companies that offer uh computer vision based technologies that help you with this defect detection um so you want to first venture out and see what's available out there so if there are like maybe two or three vendors offering a solution, AI solution to your problem, then the next thing to do is to test it in your environment. Because the vendors may publish like, hey, we have 90% accuracy on defect detection. But when you test it on your data, you may find that it's only 50% accuracy. So you'll want to evaluate these tools for a period of time and see how these tools perform in terms of accuracy on your data uh, ease of integration and also cost. So does it make sense to integrate this tool? Um, and how does it create value in that, uh, workflow? If so, if I, uh, use a off the shelf tool, um, do I own it? Do I own the data? Do I own the output or do I have to submit my data to a third party and I'm basically losing my, IP yeah, system? good question. So that. That depends on the vendor. So, so for some vendors, you'll have to send your data over a cloud service to get a prediction. But with some tools, it's on-premise. So it's within your own servers, your own systems. So the data is more in a controlled environment. So it just depends on the uh, solution that you are testing. And if you have like privacy concerns, then definitely you don't want to try a microservice. You want to try to find something more on-premise. That it can also be a microservice, but on-premise. How do I cope with security issues? So if someone is tempering my data sets, therefore the output of my model is unreliable. Uh, therefore I will make the wrong decisions. How can I prevent, or uh, do I need to invest in additional security issues? How do I deal with that? Um, so tempering with data set depends on um, how that software interfaces with your data stores. So often you are f um, feeding the data into that software. So it should not be a, a solution where that software can somehow change your data models or play around with um any proprietary information so that requires testing at a very granular scale um and if you really have security concerns there are also edge ai uh like machine learning tools where it works only on that device so it doesn't transmit any information it may not transmit any information out so that th there are solutions on how you can address security, privacy issues um, by using like edge applications. Um, if you look at industry and sectors, uh, which of the sectors are more primed for AI abduction um, and can greatly benefit from its implementation? So, and, how, and the other question, which is related to that, how can business prepare themselves uh, for the AI revolution? So it's more in general, a general question. I think so. Uh, yeah, manufacturing for sure will benefit significantly from AI. Even a simple thing like uh, predicting if a machine is going to fail can save them a lot of money because once the machine fails, um, the production is not happening. So they're losing revenues. So by predicting its failure, they can um, work on the machine and make sure it, it functions optimally over time. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in manufacturing alone, in manufacturing line, in, uh, like in the manager's workflow, like even trying to do root cause analysis of what really happened with the 
with a with a report with a defect report um and yeah streamlining the whole process including getting things out to consumers so optimizing routes to get things to consumers so what's the best route to take to get it most efficiently so a lot of opportunity in the whole manufacturing and supply chain workshop um yeah, next I would say yeah. in healthcare, yeah. um, in the physician's workflow. So this is not to replace the physician, but to make the physician a lot more efficient in the work that they do. Because a lot of times they're just doing a lot of documentation, but that documentation can actually be uh, reduced by reusing information that's already out there about the patient, like their name, their age, all of that can be pre-populated. And uh, you can even create a template for the physician to fill out the pertinent information. So there's a lot of opportunity there, um, like even in uh, analyzing CT scans. So an AI system can um, print out which are the potential tumors, and then the physician can, the radiologist can verify that it is in fact a tumor. So because they have a lot to verify, so if a system can help them, then that's going to make them more uh, efficient. And in return, Patients are going to get more care, like one-on-one -on -one care, as opposed to documentation on the physician side. Do, do, do you think that uh, the traditional companies are more at risk than uh, newly uh, startups? Or let me rephrase the question. So if is a startup uh, more in a position to benefit from the AI development than a traditional company that's already been here for years? I think startups, it depends on what type of startup. AI startups are definitely ahead of the game in that they adopt um, new tooling. They are very data savvy. They're thinking about data um, at, at the start of their processes. Um, so yes, I would say in some respects, yes, because you're already thinking about this whole AI revolution. And for companies that are more established, you'll have to think about your legacy systems. How are you going to transition from that where you are to a more uh, modernized uh, operation? That comes back to a very old economic uh, uh, concept called sunk cost. So probably you have to write it off and start all over again. Yes. For some of the systems, yes. But some software may work for decades and it's still doing its thing as efficiently as it can. So yeah, it just depends on where. It's also, I also think that uh, it's also good to know that not every single problem, uh, there is an AI to solve that problem. A lot of problems can be solved by simply automating and lines of code. So you don't need to have any AI knowledge or expertise to solve that problem, right? Correct. Yeah, actually, majority of the problems can be solved without AI, with better software engineering. Just intelligent rules can solve a lot of problems. And AI helps in cases where it's a very complex problem, where you need to look at maybe a thousand data points to render one decision, decision on a case by case basis. And then when you use a software that does that for you, it, it just magically improves your productivity because it's doing most of the work, the bulk of the work. And you are like the QA person who's verifying that whatever it's done is in fact correct. So yeah, AI has its uses, but most of the problems can be solved with traditional software engineering. Looking to the future, what are the emerging trends or advancements uh, in AI that business should be mindful of, uh, of when developing a long-term strategy? I think there'll be um, less and less coding to do per se to develop models, but more and more thinking to do to decide where exactly to deploy these models so that you're actually getting value and um, how you're going to measure the success because these models are not free and they're not also risk free because they can create a lot of havoc like make up information, it can uh, make mistakes, it can be biased. So you want to be very strategic where you're using the model 
how you're using it. Are you making it the sole decision maker or is it just uh, an assistant? So it's less risk when it's an assistant versus when it's a sole decision maker, like in a self-driving car. So, yeah. So I'd say we would move more towards strategy and focus less on the development piece. So if you, you read the book, you get access to a lot of uh, additional resources uh, that can help you to develop an AI strategy. Uh, did you all develop that from an academic point of view or uh, is it based on uh, expertise and practical knowledge and experience? It's based on all the years of uh, doing work um, in a hands-on capacity. So I do a lot of these things intuitively because it's this is what I've been doing my entire career, developing models, putting things into production, <laughs> thinking through where to put it. Um, so all of that is inside of my brain. So I try to codify it in a way that is repeatable. It's um, different people in the organization can use the same process and it's understandable. So that's that's what I try to make it. Yeah, so for all the podcast listeners uh, and viewers, uh, it's a really a practical book and I really like the checklist and the resources. So I strongly encourage you to buy the book. Uh, by the way, in the show notes, there will be a link included uh, uh, to the Amazon bookstore where you can buy the book. Uh, it gives you very uh, useful insights and uh, checklist to help to create a good strategy, uh, AI strategy for you that really will help your business. And even if you're not a AI specialist like me or a, a coder, it still is very valuable to, at least to think. I think that's the main conclusion. Think about AI and practice about AI. Vida, anything to add? Um, yeah, so the resources can get you to uh, find your AI readiness gaps. It can help you find uh, prioritized AI opportunities. Um, then there's also the workflows on how to determine um, whether an AI opportunity is worth pursuing or not. So I have a... Uh, graphical workflows for that. So lots of things to help you get prepared for AI. What's the website? Where, where to go to? Yes, it's aibusinesscasebook.com. Thank you, Kavita, for sharing your insights. If you would like to buy Kavita's book, as I mentioned in the interview, there is a link in the show notes to the Amazon bookstore. And if you if you would like to find more uh, EO Media House podcast on AI and uh, on entrepreneurship, you can go wherever, you're, wherever you get your podcast. My name is Robert van der Swart, and until next time, goodbye.